Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Watkins, and today, Juan, Benoit, and I are excited to be here to tell you more about the new Facebook.com. During the keynote presentation, Mark and Fiji showed the upcoming visual redesign. And what they didn't tell you is that this was more than just a redesign. Under the hood, the technology stack has changed as well. Let's take another peek at what the new site looks like. I cannot wait for all of you to try this for yourselves. So what were we trying to accomplish with this? We found that every time we make our services faster and simpler, people communicate more. And this is really at the heart of the new Facebook.com. We found, oh, sorry about that. It should be easy to do the things you want to do. And user research showed us this new design is simpler and more intuitive. But let's talk about fast. What does fast mean? Speed matters in two places. Time to startup and UI responsiveness. Fast startup is measured by how quickly the page is rendered and interactive after someone navigates to facebook.com for the first time. UI responsiveness means that as you click around the site, we respond quickly to your interactions and transitions are seamless. Simple and fast combine to create the app-like feel that we've all come to know and love on our mobile devices, and we wanted to bring that to the web. But it doesn't mean anything if we can't keep it that way. We have a lot of engineers at Facebook contributing code. To maintain consistency and quality, these need to be baked into the entire system. Sustainability means it needs to be easy to design, iterate on, and maintain the user experience. And the thing is, our existing site couldn't meet all of these. Our old tech stack wasn't going to be able to deliver a performance experience with an app-like feel. Changing the styles and layout wasn't going to cut it. By starting over, we freed ourselves from the constraints of our legacy infra, and we were best positioned to accomplish our goals. So the new Facebook.com is a brand new single page web app powered by React, GraphQL, and Relay. How are we doing this? Today, Juan will talk about how we're using Relay to simplify and streamline our data fetching. Benoit will talk about how we're improving the delivery and efficiency of our JavaScript code. And I'll talk about how we're trying to make the new Facebook.com be a great user experience for everyone. Please join me in welcoming Juan Tejada from the Relay team to the stage. Hey, everyone. So as we've just mentioned, we're using GraphQL and Relay to do data fetching in our app. In case you're not familiar with GraphQL, GraphQL is a declarative query language used for requesting data from a server. GraphQL is agnostic to how you store your data in the back end and provides a unified type-safe layer on top of all your server data so that it can be easily queried by multiple clients over time. In fact, we use GraphQL to power our mobile applications, and we're using it to power the new Facebook.com Facebook too now. With that said, the main focus of this section of the talk is going to be Relay, which is the JavaScript client we use in the browser to fetch GraphQL data. Relay is a JavaScript framework we developed here at Facebook for managing and fetching data in React applications. In this section of the talk, I'm going to tell you about how we're using Relay to scale data fetching across a large, complex application like the new Facebook.com, and what important opportunities this unlocks for us in order to ensure that our application can both start up fast and have instant responsive UI interactions. So you might be wondering, why do we need a whole framework just to fetch some data? Well, let's go over an example to answer this question. Let's consider this post. Let's say this post is a single React component 
which has a few different data requirements. To render it, we can easily describe the data that this post needs with a GraphQL query and fetch it from the server. This will work, but this post might not always be rendered by itself. This post could be part of a news feed, which in turn could be part of the home page itself. Each of these sections in the page will have their own distinct data requirements. So how do we fetch them? Well, one simple approach could be for each section in this page to independently fetch the data that they need. This means, though, we'd be sending multiple network requests during initial render, and this can end up hurting user experience and performance. That being said, we can improve the situation just using GraphQL. With GraphQL, we can accumulate the data requirements for each of these sections and describe the data that the whole page needs in a single top-level query. This will be better because we can save the work of starting multiple network requests and get all the data we need in a single round trip. But if we do this, we introduce a new problem. For instance, what if we want to reuse this post across different pages? As we know, this post has some data requirements. So what this means is that each of these pages need to include the data that this component needs in their queries. But what happens when the data that this post needs changes? Well, now we have to make sure that each of these queries are updated to include the new requirements. If we forget to do that, we can end up in a situation where we're fetching the wrong data or not enough data for this post. But let's say that we manage to update all of our queries. Well, what happens when a page stops rendering the posts? Again, if we forget to remove this query from that page, this data from that page, we'll end up with the opposite problem, where we're fetching more data than we actually need to use. And even if we manage to get this right, even with a small number of queries and components, this can become very error prone very quickly. As the application grows and more engineers start adding more features, components, each with their own distinct data requirements, this will very quickly become unsustainable for us to maintain. Errors will start creeping up, data will be overfetched or underfetched, and engineers will need to have an understanding of almost the entire system, even to make small changes. So how do we make this sustainable? How do we make it so the app and its data requirements can grow and change while keeping all of this complexity manageable? Well, that's where Relay comes in. With Relay, components and their data requirements are no longer separate. Instead, the data requirements for the component are declared inside the component and become part of the component itself. This means that each component declares the data that it needs right next to where it uses it. This is really helpful because it ensures that we can continue reasoning locally about our components and write them without worrying about how their data is being, going to be fetched or how that affects other parts of the system and focus only on describing exactly the data that they need. Instead, Relay will fetch this data for us and make sure that each component has the data that it needs whenever it renders. As we build our components using Relay, Relay will build up global knowledge of the data requirements for the entire system and statically know exactly what data is needed for any given page, even as data requirements change over time. All right, so we're using Relay everywhere to build our app and to scale our data fetching. So this unlocks a few optimization opportunities that we can capture. First, let's talk about parallelizing work. The way we would traditionally fetch data in a client-rendered app would probably look something like this. First, we download the code for our app, then we start rendering, and as we do, we send a network request to fetch the data that we need. This means that we'll need to render a loading screen and wait for a while. Eventually, when the data comes back from the server, we can render the final content to our users. In this situation, if we could start fetching this data earlier, we might be able to show content sooner and even entirely skip a loading screen. The problem is, how could we possibly know what data a page is going to need before we even start rendering it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Relay has all of this information. And not only that, this information is available ahead of time. What this means is that we don't need to run the application in the browser to know what data a page is eventually going to need to request. 
What this allows us to do is that as soon as we get that initial request for a page, our server can start delivering the data down to the client in parallel with the code. By doing this, we can save some time and hopefully make our application start up faster. So we can parallelize the work of downloading the code and fetching the data, but sometimes there are even more improvements we can do by adjusting how and when we deliver this data to the client. For instance, let's say we're already fetching our data as soon as we can. However, even if we do this, we might still run into cases where the data that we need just takes too long to fetch. When this happens, we're back in a case where we need to show a loading screen and wait for a while before we can render our content. If we take a look at our queries, maybe the reason it takes so long is because we're fetching too much data or data that's too expensive to compute. And the question is, do we need all of this data just to show that initial paint on the screen? Maybe some of that data is initially hidden or rendered outside the viewport. For instance, we usually don't need to show more than one newsfeed post for the initial render of the page. So we shouldn't need to wait to fetch all of the posts before we can render anything. So what this means is that we can tra treat some of our data as the most critical data. And this doesn't mean that we won't need the rest of the data, only that we can afford to wait just a little longer for it if that means we can get the critical data delivered sooner. With GraphQL and Relay, we can actually mark which parts of our query are the most critical and which parts are less critical. By doing so, the server can deliver the critical data as soon as possible in a separate payload without having to wait for the whole query to be completed. This means that hopefully we'll be able to show that initial content sooner, and then the rest of the data will be progressively delivered in separate payloads, each of which may cause less critical content to be rendered. Note here that all of this data is still delivered in a single request, so we're not incurring an extra cost for new network requests. So we can split up our query to deliver content sooner, but there are even more improvements that we can do. As it turns out, sometimes the way we structure our apps can make it so we download both code and data that we never end up using. This can commonly happen when we need to render two variations of a UI, depending on some data or some user conditions. For instance, at Facebook, a single post could maybe be a photo, or it could be a video. And when we render a post, we can't know ahead of time what type of post it's going to be. This might depend on what type of page you're visiting or what type of user you are. What this implies is that our component needs to know how to render both variations of this post. That is, it will need to include both the code and data for the photo variation and the code and data for the video variation. But what if a user visits a page and never ends up seeing a video? Well, then we unnecessarily downloaded a bunch of resources that we didn't end up using and wasted some time. And you might think this isn't a big deal, it's just a little bit of wasted resources, but at Facebook, this is a huge deal. A photo isn't just a video or a post. A, photo can, a post can actually be a myriad different things, like an event, a song, an album, or even a fundraiser. So if we downloaded all of these resources up front, we actually end up wasting a ton of resources. If we don't want to download all these resources up front, one thing we could do is split up the work and only download enough until we can tell exactly what extra resources we're going to need. And then when we know that we need to fetch those extra resources, we can fetch them in separate requests. But as I mentioned before, starting multiple network requests during initial render can dramatically hurt user, user experience. For example, if a user happens to need a video as their first post in newsfeed, they're going to have a bad experience because they're, they're going to need to wait for these extra requests before they can see anything on the screen. So how do we download exactly the amount of resources that we need as early as possible? Well, again, we can use GraphQL and Relay to do this. With GraphQL, we can model the different variations of our UI and describe the types of posts a post can be. When we write our query, we can also describe the data that we want back when a post matches a specific type. That is, if the post ends up being a photo, we want the photo data back. But if it's a video, we want the video data back. And if it's a song, we want the song data back. 
When the server executes and returns the data for this, po for this query, as soon as, as, as soon as it knows that we're querying for a video, for example, it will, then we'll only download the video data in this request. This is better because now we can download this data earlier as part of the initial GraphQL request without having to start new requests for data. However, at this point, we still need to wait until we start rendering before we can render, uh, fetch that extra code. Well, that's where Relay comes in. With Relay, we can also express which component code we're going to need in order to render the data that matches a specific type. Essentially, it's like we're treating code as data itself. And here, the same conditions continue to apply. If the post ends up being a, a video, we know that we only need to download the video component code. In practice, we can't just deliver this code as part of the GraphQL request, though. We still need to deliver this code separately. But what this does allow us to do is as the server is resolving this query, when it knows that it's going to return a video post, it can immediately start sending this video component code down to the client a lot earlier, which again means that we'll hopefully be able to show the final content to our users a lot sooner. So I've talked about a few strategies we use to make sure that our application can start up fast. But to close off, I briefly want to tell you about how we're using cache data to ensure that our application can have instant and responsive UI interactions. Apart from fetching data from the server, Relay also keeps a local in-memory cache of the data that it has fetched so far. This means that when we need to fetch a query from the server, if Relay has cached any of that data locally, we can reuse it to instantly give feedback to our users when they perform an action. For example, if we were to navigate to the profile page here, we can immediately show the data that we've already cached, even if it's not the whole data for the page. In this example, for example, the name and the profile picture. Then, as more data is fetched from the server, we can progressively show the rest of the content. Once we've visited a page, we can return to it instantly, since all of that data for that page will have already been cached by Relay. So I've talked about a few ways in which we can leverage GraphQL and Relay to ensure that we provide a great experience in our application. But data is really only half the picture. Up next, I'd like to invite Benoit up to the stage to tell us about how we simplify and deliver JavaScript code in our application. Thanks, Juan. To make the new Facebook.com fast, we had to rethink how we deliver code to the user. We found, on, on the old Facebook.com, we found that as we continued to grow, we started facing more and more problems. If you're like me a few years ago, you're probably wondering, why is this even difficult? It's easy, right? You take your code, you put it in a few packages, you add it to your page, and then you're done. Well, that works well when you're small. But eventually, as you grow, you're going to find, like us, that your page slows down and you encounter more problems. Why is that? This is what a typical load might look like. As you grow, you'll notice that a lot of the code that you're sending is in use for the initial display of the page. <coughs> the unused code might be for interactions that can only be performed after you've started up the page. Or it might be for an A-B experiment that the user is not a part of. Or like Juan mentioned, there's a lot of possible story types but only one or two will be used for the initial display of the page. So this means even more unused code. By removing and deferring unused code, we can improve startup performance. This is called code splitting. On the old Facebook.com site, we solve this by adding APIs to make code splitting easier. We can code split based on which A-B experiment a user's on, or we can wait until data is about to be used to fetch it or we can defer the loading of modules until after startup. Users that don't need any of this code will see a dramatically slower load. However, users that hit code splitting on the startup path will see a dramatically slower load. This is because if we're in the middle of rendering a page and we hit one of these code split points, we have to interrupt the rendering of that page and download the missing code before we can continue to render. For example, if you see a video post, there's a good chance that the video player code will be split out of, of the initial payload, which means you have to wait for that video player code to download. And the problem is that we might hit more than one of these code split points on any given startup, 
every time you hit one of these code split points, your, your download takes, or your startup takes even longer because you're waiting on more of these requests. To maintain good loading performance on the old Facebook.com site, we have to constantly monitor all our code split points and make sure that they're behaving properly in production. At our scale, with so many engineers, we found that this was simply unsustainable. But how do we make this sustainable? How do we send down exactly the right code without ever making performance worse? For the new Facebook.com, we decided to reimagine how we did code splitting. In the previous slides, we talked about two classes of problems. One is delivering too much code that isn't used. Two, it's not delivering important code. But really, both of these are the same problem. We don't know what code we need at the beginning of the request. The reason for this is our code split APIs. Like the video player, we only discover what code we need in the middle of the request while we're executing on the client. If we could somehow determine exactly the code that we need at the beginning of the request, then we can make sure that we deliver exactly the code that the user needs. Let's look at how we fix our code splitting APIs for the new Facebook.com. First, let's talk about EB experiments. Here we have two variations of the composer. If the user is part of this experiment, they will receive additional functionality. We want to make sure that only users that are part of this experiment receive the additional code. Before, on the old site, the code was imported in the middle of the startup sequence. For the new Facebook.com, we decided to move to a new declarative API that's discovered via a build step. At the beginning of the request, we can determine if the user needs the additional code for this AB experiment. This means shipping the right code right away to the user by doing a quick check. Now that we've improved AB experiments, what about on render? On the old site, we found that when we code split on render, it's because the decision to run the code is based off data we receive from the server. Like one mentioned, this is fixed by implementing data-driven dependencies using Relay. If the server returns a video post, then we know right away we need to send down the video player. Now this leaves us with one more code split API to improve. This is the one that I'm the most excited about. We want to load the minimum amount of code and we want to defer any code that isn't required for startup until later. For the new Facebook.com, we decided to reimagine how we defer code. First, we want to design to drive the loading experience of the user and not the code split point themselves. Therefore, we've designed our page load into three phases. The first phase is responsible for showing an initial loading screen to the user. The second phase is responsible for doing a full display. And the third phase is responsible for making the page interactive. Each phase has a very clear purpose to the user. To see how this works, let's take a look at the home page dependency tree. The page is composed of a root, which is responsible for rendering the page structure. In our case, we have the left navigation, newsfeed, and the right column. While we're waiting for code and data to download, we want each of these components to be able to put up a loading screen. And so um, you have the implementation of the components themselves, which they'll also include, which often brings in a lot more code. And then your components will have many interactions, such as menus, buttons, and editors. And we want to make sure that we pull in this last, because it's not required for the initial display of the page. So to show our loading screen, we, want, we don't need the majority of this code here. We could, load, we could use lazy loading on startup. But if we import that code lazily, it means that we have, to, we have to render, we have to wait until we're rendering the page to start fetching the remainder of the code. And so this means another round trip. As we've seen, this can make the page load dramatically slower. Instead, if we just annotate the import using a new declarative API, imports for display. By creating new declarative edges in our code dependency graph, we're able to easily identify which resources are required for the loading screen and the display of the page. And we can do this without having to run any of this code on the client. We can figure this out right away. Now it's the same for a third phase. We introduce a new declarative API called imports for interaction. This lets us easily separate the interaction code from the display code. With this, we're able to take our code dependency graph 
and split it in two or three phases at build time without running any of this code on the client. This means we can take our single blocking download, we can split it up into three phases, and then we can do the rendering in three phases, the loading screen, the full page, and the interactions separately. Each of these phases will render exactly what we expect according to how the site was designed. But this leaves us with a problem. How do we render quickly on slower devices? On the new Facebook.com, we're building a strong foundation for server rendering. By using server rendering, we can show a fully rendered page while we're still waiting for code to download. Once we're confident about our implementation for server rendering, we plan on exploring how server rendering allows new optimizations that aren't otherwise possible. However, the key to being fast on the web is to be as small as possible. Splitting into three phases isn't useful if you can't make the code smaller. To ensure that we're as small as possible, we've decided to introduce code size budgets. Budgeting code size for us starts with the design process. Our startup goal is not driven by technical details, but it's designed based on how long the user expects to wait. For the new Facebook.com, performance was one of the most important features we wanted to deliver. With a startup goal in mind, we picked how much code could we load in that amount of time? And this became our code size budgets. But once we have a code size target, how do we track it? For example, let's take a look at our homepage. We break down a page by the features and teams that build on it. Here we have the top navigation, the left navigation, stories, the right column, and newsfeed. With this breakdown, every team that's contributing to this page is invested in keeping it efficient. But we have hundreds of pages like this. We created a tool where we can list the size of each, of each page on our site, and then we can calculate the code size by each of these phases. Then we add code size targets for each of these phases. Now at a glance, we can see if any of these pages are too large. And then we subdivide complex pages by the teams and features that build on it, like we've just seen for the home page. With the new site, we understand where every byte is going on every page, but we need more. We need state-of-the-art tools that let us zoom into our code graph. We need to get better at finding opportunities for size improvements. We've built tools like Graph Explorer that highlight all of the new declarative edges that we've all the new declarative code split APIs that we've added, the common ancestors of shared code, and how to remove modules. With these improvements and tools, we've been able to make code delivery sustainable again. But we need to do more than just mastering data and code. I'd like to invite Ashley Watkin back to the stage. I want to tell you more about how our technology stack enables us to deliver a great user experience for everyone by default. We have over 2 billion monthly active users. This means a huge range of network conditions, device classes, abilities people have, and languages people speak. And we need to provide a great experience across all of these situations. And someone's experience really starts from the moment they type in facebook.com and hit enter. Juan and Benoit have already talked about how we've made our data and JavaScript fast, but there's one more piece to the puzzle. On our old site, we were sending too much CSS. This amount has grown over time. If you load the homepage today, you might download up to 450 kilobytes of compressed CSS, with an uncompressed size of 2.3 megabytes. And this is just for the homepage alone. Here's how our styles are structured today. We have a class. There are a few rules defined within it, and another class, and some more rules. This is pretty standard, but what's wrong with this? Rules are duplicated throughout the style sheet, and that just means wasted bytes. So instead, we generate an atomic style sheet. That means that we take these rules, and we merge them together so that each rule is defined only once. Each rule is given its own class, and components can then pick multiple classes in order to get the same effect. Before. Every new feature meant more lines of CSS added to our style sheet. Now, new JavaScript doesn't have to mean new CSS. As we add new components, they can use the existing styles, meaning the style sheet will plateau at a low byte size. 
And that single atomic cell sheet can be used across the entire site. But no matter how fast our data, JavaScript, and CSS are, the page still needs to load. How can we make loading a delightful experience? If we get this wrong, the content is jumping around, and the text, images, and icons are coming in at different times. Let's look at that again. This doesn't feel good. What's the right way to do this instead? We want to load the content in the order that we read, so in English, we want to load top down and left to right. First, we load the top bar, then the left column, and so on. But in order to do this, the different pieces need to be coordinating. Any of the components on this page might be waiting on data, code, or images. Historically, centralizing the experience with React would have required a lot of engineering overhead. But now, the new React suspense component can help us. Here we have a post. If we wrap it in a suspense boundary, then React can coordinate whether to show a loading state or the full content. And the suspense boundary works like a try-catch. First, React will try to render the content, but any of the images could be wait or any of the pieces could be waiting on code, data, or images. Let's say the body is waiting for the image. It can let React know it's not ready, and the suspense boundary responds to that and renders the loading state instead. Then, once the image is ready, we can replace the loading state with the final content. React Suspense simplifies the code necessary to make this happen, and these boundaries are nestable. When nested this way, we can create the top-down and left-right loading experience that we're looking for. And here's what this looks like all together. This gives us a small number of paints, images come in at the same time as the content, and the content doesn't move once it displays. So we focused on the initial page load so far, but what about subsequent navigations as we're using the site? We continue to use the same optimizations for client-side routing that Juan and Benoit already talked about for the initial page load. We still incrementally load the code and data, which lets us show the loading states early and get the final content on the screen as quickly as possible. Both client-side routing, there's even more that we can do. Here we're on our newsfeed and we get a notification. How likely do you think it is that we're going to want to click on that notification? Probably pretty likely. So as soon as we show it, we can begin to fetch that first download so that we have a head start. We're immediately ready with the loading state, and we have less code and data to fetch for the final render. And if we have a high enough confidence and the code is small enough, we might even prefetch the full experience, letting us jump straight to the final render. But can we do more? Think about using a native app on your phone. You can move back and forth between pages without losing your place. This lets you stay focused on what you're trying to do right now without worrying about whether or not you can get back to what you were doing before. And the new Facebook.com supports this. You can start here on your newsfeed, scroll down, click on someone's profile, effortlessly go back to where you were, respond to a notification, and then go through your notifications list in line. Everything comes together to give us that app-like feel with seamless navigations. What about the experience within a page? Our research shows us that people come to use Facebook on all kinds of different screen sizes, and many of them are quite small. So we redesigned the site with a three-column layout to better serve our users, allowing people to focus on the content that matters. We also need to respond quickly to user input. This gets tricky because of JavaScript execution. Let's say we're here in the loading stages and someone clicks on one of the already visible buttons. We want to respond to the input, but we're in the middle of executing a lot of JavaScript in order to render the rest of the page. This is a typical JavaScript execution block. And if there's a user interaction, we'd have to wait until the current block ends in order to respond to it. Instead, what if we could be periodically checking to see if we needed to respond to input? Then, when we reach the next check after the interaction, we could deprioritize or cancel the current work in favor of responding to that input. And this is now possible because of a new browser API called Is Input Pending. It provides a way to quickly check the event queue without adding a lot of overhead to the current execution block. This is the first browser feature implemented by Facebook, and the API is out in origin trial, and we hope to see it fully launch soon. 
And this is just the beginning of our collaboration with the Chrome team and other browsers as part of a broader effort for JavaScript scheduling on the web. So we also need to be mindful and responsive to different device capabilities. Take this loading state for a post. It's kind of nice, right? But we found that when we put a couple of these on a device with limited CPU and add in some other background activity, we were actually maxing out the device and the entire experience degraded. To handle this, we check whether the device can stably render these animations, and if it can't, we freeze the animation. The experience is still complete, but tailored to the user. We've also done more to give the user direct control over their experience. First, let's talk about theming. Theming is important for a few reasons. We have a different primary design for pages like the Watch tab, where a darker background experience is more comfortable for watching videos. Our styles and components need to be usable here as well, and we need to swap the color definitions dynamically on a page navigation. To support this, we switched using native CSS variables for colors. The colors change without downloading any extra CSS or refreshing the page. This also enabled something else, dark mode. Low light situations are more comfortable with a dark screen, and for some people, it reduces things like eye strain and migraines. In addition to theming, we're also giving users control over their font sizes. Some people may want or need a larger or smaller font size. In many websites today, you have to use the zoom functionality to make the text larger. But this also increases the size of things that you may not need to have increased, like images, which makes the website even more difficult to use, especially on smaller screen sizes. So we've changed how our CSS is built in order to support this. Let's look at three ways we can define font sizes. Pixels, M's, and rems. Pixels are static. The font will always be that size, regardless of browser settings or element positioning. M's are relative to the parent size, so you can set it to be a time and a half larger than the parent font size. But M's compound, which means if you set all divs to have a font size of one and a half M's, and then you have nested divs, the font will get larger and larger. Rems are similar to M's. They're relative, but they're relative to the root of the page. This avoids confusion around nesting, but also provides the flexibility to adjust the font sizes across the site. So this is what we want to use. But for engineers, the hard part is that we tend to get our designs in pixels. So to support this, we automatically convert pixel font sizes to rems in our build step. Let's see what it looks like. Focus here on the words themselves. By using rems, we respect users' browser settings for their preferred font size by default. And we're able to give them a way to customize their font size directly on our website itself. Much of this so far has been about the visual experience of using the new Facebook.com, but there's even more to it than that. This was an overhaul for assistive technologies as well. I want to cover just a few of the things we're doing in this space. First, our new component library has been designed with accessibility in mind from the start. A great example of this is what we call contextual headings. On the Notifications tab, for a screen reader, we want notifications to be the main level one heading for the page, and then the event name could be a second level heading. However, when we're looking at the event page directly, we want the event name to be the main level one heading. To adjust this, we've created what we call contextual headings that respond to the context they're in to adjust these varying conditions, all without any extra work from the engineer. But solutions like this aren't quite enough. When components are used in certain ways or in certain combinations, it's still possible for accessibility issues to occur. And traditionally, we then use things like education and linting to try to prevent these, but we took it a step further. In our development environment, if elements are inaccessible, then we also visually and functionally block them out. We also provide context about what's wrong so that the engineer can quickly and efficiently solve the problem. It's easy to forget about experiences that are not our own, but we want Facebook to support a wide range of abilities. And what we found time and time again is that a great user experience starts with a great developer experience. The right thing should happen by default. And when this isn't possible, the right thing should be far easier to do than the wrong one. 
By taking this approach, we're able to do our jobs better and faster so that we can provide quality experiences to people that come to our website. Today, Juan showed us how we can write and maintain intricate data dependencies seamlessly while delivering the pieces we need when we need them. Benoit showed us how, with some changes to our APIs and resource loading strategies, we can deliver minimal, efficient code. And I've covered some of the many changes we've made to our user experience. This is just the beginning. We're continuing to learn and iterate. And as we find solutions that work for us, we'll be sure to share them out with you, the community, so that we can all improve the web together. We'll be in the open source section of the developer resource area if you have any questions or just want to chat. And we'd love to hear any feedback you have about this session today, so please reach out. Thank you.